Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everyone. I'm not Craig Anderson, as it says in your order of service. I'm Kathy Delianis, filling in for Craig, who had to be out of town. Well, I'm happy to welcome all of you here. I'm a member of the governing board here at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Reston. And I'm so happy to see a mostly full sanctuary and welcome to everyone on Zoom as well on this lovely, finally, spring day. So whether you're on Zoom or in the sanctuary, we're very happy you're here, no matter how old or young you are, wherever you are on your spiritual journey and whomever you love and however you identify, please know that you are welcome here. Before we start, I um, have a few announcements. First of all, we are happy to announce that the new ERV air circulator, that big monster uh, contraption in the closet was finally installed and is now running and pumping fresh air into our sanctuary. Some of the cleanest air in your air in Northern Virginia. <laughs> um, secondly, we hope you will join us for our 2023 Passover Seder celebration. It'll be held on Thursday, April 6th. The deadline for signing up is today and there are flyers and I think there's something also in the e-blast, but you can sign up online. Uh, it's a really fun celebration. I've attended several times. I unfortunately can't make it this year. Um, third announcement during the service on Sunday, April 9th, which is Easter Sunday, children will take part in a canned food hunt instead of hunting for eggs. And all canned food will be um, donated afterwards to a shelter. So we do need some more cans. So please bring um, cans to donate and they will be collected. Uh, you can donate them until Sunday, April 2nd. So next Sunday, please remember to bring your cans. Uh, final announcement. Uh, this coming week, Reverend Scott will be working um, remotely, but he can still be reached by email and phone. Oh, and now I would like to introduce our stewardship chair, Kara Fortner, who will give us an update on the stewardship campaign. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, last we have had a great stewardship campaign so far. Last week we had our uh, wonderful gala right here in the sanctuary where um, we had musical performances and uh, fellowship and tacos, and it was wonderful. And we uh, were able to secure quite a lot for our pledges for our um, next year's operating fund for our budget for next year. So, But we're not quite there yet. As of this morning, as David Slater and Roger Lowen who is somewhere in here. They gave me their pledges this morning. So as of this morning, our pledges are standing at $206,000. Yeah. <laughs> our goal, our goal is 385, $385,000. So we still got a little way to go. That's 50, that's 50, three pledges, 53 or 54 pledges that have been made. And there are plenty of us in this congregation who have not yet made their pledges. Uh, and so hopefully more will come in. If you have any questions about how to make your pledge, come talk to me. I'll be uh, at the pledge, I'll be at the table with the green tablecloth out here in the foyer. Um, and I will gratefully take your pledge and answer any questions you have. This is our beloved, faith community that has moved me so much to go to seminary and tear my hair out over theological studies and it is worth it is worth every single hour i commit and dime that i pledge uh, because this faith that we cultivate here it's a beautiful thing so thank you All right, well now let us center ourselves for worship and listen to the prelude played by our guest musician, Kate Shepard, who will be playing her viola for us. Thank you. 
Our opening words this morning come from poet Annie Lightheart. One morning I was looking out the window when a great wild goodness came over me. I wanted to be kind to everything. I promised not to kill the big spider on the wall. In the cold, I took the dog for a long walk she had been wanting. I fetched a trash can lid for an ornery neighbor and did not just then add a single adjective to his name. I went back inside to do laundry and dishes with a clean heart, such as I have never had. Before dinner, the wild goodness shouted, too tame, too tame. So I went outside with my coat and shouted poems up to the stars until my children came home with their small, warm hands. Then we ate bread in the kitchen, unafraid to be happy. The stars in wild darkness were right over our heads. Best poem ever. Amen. Our opening hymn. morning. In honor of the first day of spring, which happened this past week, we're going to sing hymn number 63, Spring Has Now Unwrapped the Flowers. And if you are at home on Zoom, the words will be in your chat box. I hear in the sanctuary, please rise in body or spirit and join us. Leslie Tyson, your worship associate. Today's chalice lighting comes from Gate Katie Savani Gelfand. She's director of religious education at the First UU Church of New Orleans. The abundance of our lives together. We light our chalice as a symbol of gratitude as we celebrate the abundance of our lives together. In this sanctuary, we harvest bushels of strength for one another, and we offer our crop with the hands of compassion and generosity. In the authentic and gentle manner of our connections, we cultivate a simple sweetness to brighten our spirits. May we, may we be grateful and compassionate for the ways we nourish and uplift each other for it is the sharing of this hallowed time together that sustains us. At UUCR, we have a tradition of singing our covenant together every Sunday. Love is the spirit of this church. So again, if you're 
at home on Zoom, we hope you will sing along. And here in the sanctuary, let's remain seated as we sing together. Now is the time for all ages. So if you're feeling young of body or young of spirit, you can come up and sit on the floor. There's a few seats in the front. And if you're at home, welcome, welcome. Good morning. Hello. And I think we have some more people joining us. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Great to see all these faces here today. And our story this morning is called The Miracle of the Loaves and Fishes. It's an ancient story from the Christian Bible. As I tell the story, I invite you to imagine yourself as part of the crowd. What do you hear? What do you see? smell, and how do you feel? According to this story, after Jesus had heard that his friend John the Baptist had died, he decided he wanted to go somewhere to be alone because he was very sad. So he went to a place he knew on the shores of Galilee, but a large crowd followed him from the towns. And I now read from Matthew chapter 14. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd. He had compassion for them and cured the sick. When it was evening, the disciples, who were the 12 main followers of Jesus, came to him and said, this is a deserted place. And the hour is now late and the crowds Send the crowds away so that they may go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, they need not go away. Give them something to eat. The disciples replied, we have nothing but five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them to me. And he told the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and two fishes, he looked up to the heaven and blessed them and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples who gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, women, and children. There ends the reading. But I wonder, do you think this really happened? According to this story, there were 5,000 people, many times larger than the group here, and they only had five fish and two, or five loaves of bread and two fish, and that filled everyone up with leftovers? Hmm. Well, some Christians believe this really happened that Jesus, with the help of God, caused a miracle and made those bread, that bread and fish multiply into enough for many thousands of people. Many Unitarian Universalists believe this is a different type of story. The, the miracles of the 
loaves and fishes was that the crowd was so moved by Jesus's compassion and generosity that they reached into their pockets and their personal bags. This was a long time ago, before there were fast food restaurants like McDonald's. So people usually carried a little bit of food with them, just in case. So they reached into those hidden bits of food and they shared them. And lo and behold, that was a miracle because everyone was fed with food left over. By this interpretation of the story, it shows that compassion is contagious. When we do something that's compassionate or generous, it spreads through the world in ripples. May each of us find ways to let our generosity and compassion ripple out into the world. Now, I have something special for you today. We have some pipe cleaners and I am going to invite, you can come up and get a couple of pipe cleaners if, you want to, if you're here on the floor. You can go ahead and do that. And I'm going to invite some of our older children to take a basket and pass it to someone at the end of an aisle. And with those pipe cleaners, you can make something to remind yourself of compassion. And I made a heart for that. Something that will remind you of the story. I made a fish for that. And, or something else that you hear during the service today. After, you've, after you're done, please go back to your seats. Those are, those are pretty colors. There's lots of, so you can go back to your seat now. And if you like, we have activities. Don't. Okay, great, thank. And I'll, I look forward to seeing what everyone makes. And we do have activities for our youngest people downstairs and you may go just before the sermon for that. Thank you, Linda. So now is the time in our service when we share our joys and concerns both here in the sanctuary and at home remotely. If you are joining us remotely, you may want to light a virtual candle where you are to remind you what's on your heart this morning. And if you want to share a joy or concern in the chat, please do so, the Zoom chat, but know that that does become public. As people here with us this morning come forward and take a stone for each joy or concern or sorrow that they have and place it in the vessel of water which holds so much of our love. And those here may also take a stone from around the, the bowl to remind them this week of what's on their heart. Let our ritual now begin.
Let us now be one in spirit. Spirit of life and love, which so faithfully animates this complicated creation of ours, we are grateful this hour for this community which remains with us in both times of joy and sorrow. And we do hold in our hearts this morning all who are facing any hardship or difficulty in their lives, those who are grieving or facing illness or disability in themselves or those around them. Whether shared here this morning or held silently in hearts, may our joys be multiplied in community and may all gathered here this hour find comfort and calm. Amen. As a self-funded church, UCR relies on the generosity of its members and friends to fund daily operations and to ensure that the church and its resources are here for us now and in the future. Pledges support our worship and music programs, our religious education programs, programs for members and friends, community outreach, and connections to Unitarian Universalism. We now invite you to support the work of UU Reston by making your donation to the collection plate if you're here in person or at the link in the slide in the chat box. Thank you for your generosity and support of our beloved spiritual home. As I, oh, the kids are going to be leaving now, those who wish to. So this morning, as I continue my 12-part sermon series on 12 Gates to the City, How to Enter the Holy City of Your Own Life, our reading on compassion comes from the Dalai Lama's wonderful and important book, Ethics for the New Millennium, which he wrote in 1999, as true today, 23 years later, as it was then. Love and compassion are the true religions to me. We can reject everything else. Religion, ideology, all received wisdom, but we cannot escape the necessity of love and compassion. 
This then is my true religion, my simple faith, love and compassion. In this sense, there is no need for a temple or church, for a mosque or synagogue, no need uh, for complicated philosophy, doctrine, or dogma. The purpose of all the major religious traditions of the world is not to construct big temples on the outside, but to create temples of goodness and compassion inside, in our hearts. Our own heart, our own mind is the temple. The doctrine is compassion, love for others and respect for their rights and dignity, no matter who or what they are. Ultimately, these are all that we need. So long as we practice compassion and love in our daily lives, then no matter if we are learned or unlearned, whether we believe in Buddha or God, or follow some other religion, or none at all, as long as we have compassion for others and conduct ourselves with restraint out of a sense of responsibility, there is no doubt we will be happy. Only the development of compassion and understanding for others can bring us the tranquility and happiness we all seek. And then the Dalai Lama ends. The more we care for the happiness of others, the greater is our own sense of well-being. Cultivating a close, warm-hearted feeling for others automatically puts the mind at ease. It is the ultimate source of success in life. Here ends our morning reading. Thank you, Leslie. So I wanna begin by reiterating the absolute importance of what the Dalai Lama just affirmed in this morning's reading. It is compassion and nothing less that is humanity's most, most universal, spiritual and ethical principle. All of the great religious teachers and traditions of humanity teach that it is compassion that should lie at the center and soul of everything that is called religious and should, to the maximum degree possible, inform and instruct us in our lives and in our relationships. In her very important book, The Great Transformation, The Beginnings of Our Religious Traditions, religious historian Karen Armstrong asserts that in the, in the ninth century, ninth to second century BCE, before Jesus's time, the so-called Axial Age, Four distinct traditions, she writes, quote, that have continued to nourish humanity to the present day, Confucianism and Taoism in China, Hinduism and Buddhism in India, monotheism in Israel, and philosophical rationalism in Greece. All these four traditions moved in response to the violence and inhumanity of their age to articulate, quote, a new universal ethic of empathy and compassion toward all human beings. I quote Armstrong, the axial age was pivotal to the spiritual development of humanity. The prophets, mystics, philosophers, and poets of the axial age all taught a spirituality of empathy and compassion. They all insisted that people must abandon their egoism and greed, violence and unkindness, and embrace respect for the sacred rights of all persons. Each tradition, she goes on, developed its own formulation of this golden rule. The actual traditions all taught that if people behaved with kindness and generosity to their fellows, they could save the world. I would suggest to you that it is this universal ethic of compassion and empathy, which has always animated our faith tradition, Unitarian Universalism. But this begs the question, okay, but what exactly is compassion? And how in God's name do we bring more of it into our lives, into our hearts, and into our world? Well, the, world, the word compassion 
comes from the root of two separate Latin words. Next slide. It comes from the word calm, meaning together, and the word passion, meaning to suffer. Compassion, therefore, means, quote, to suffer together. And one source I consulted for this sermon gave this two-pronged definition for compassion. Compassion is the feeling that arises when, first, you are confronted with another suffering, and then you feel motivated to relieve that suffering. Compassion then begins with awareness of someone else's suffering and ends, crucially, with action to help alleviate it. Now, although empathy and sympathy are words that mean something like compassion, as if, uh, uh, sorry, empathy and sympathy means something alike, compassion as a human virtue goes much further than empathy or sympathy. Empathy is the feeling with, sympathy having a fellow feeling, but compassion, again, is awareness of others suffering plus a feeling animated and motivated to do something to alleviate that suffering. Compassion then, and this is crucial, compassion requires more than feeling, it requires action, personal engagement and risk on the behalf of someone else's humanity. So compassion, unlike both empathy and sympathy, actually requires you to do something. Don't just stand there, do something. When you become aware of the suffering of another. The key difference is that action makes compassion much more spiritually and ethically demanding than just having sympathy, oh, you poor thing, or empathy, I feel your pain, brother. Compassion requires you as a fellow human being to get up off your duff and actually do something concrete, something humane and tangible and real to relieve the suffering of the other. It requires that you take those empathetic and sympathetic feelings into your heart and then use them to move your hands and your feet to actually do something to make life better for someone else. And this is precisely what Jesus of Nazareth was both spiritually and ethically saying to the people of his time. His message can be simply reduced, as the Dalai Lama points out, to be compassionate. This is at the center and soul of his message to humanity and every other great spiritual teacher of humanity. Of all the passages attributed to Jesus that can be found in Christian scriptures, None is more powerful or meaningful to me personally than that found in the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew. You all know it. In this familiar passage, Jesus is describing what is required for a human being to be a good and righteous person. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. And I was naked, and you clothed me. I was ill, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and it was you who visited me. So all the great religious traditions of all teachers of all time call us to be more actively compassionate in our life. And here's the really good news about, <clears throat> about all of this. Recently, social scientists from a wide variety of interrelated fields of study have been able to verify that we human beings are hardwired, literally hardwired for empathy and compassion. This is good news. You can't escape it. You're hardwired for it. In other words, compassion does come naturally to human beings. In his groundbreaking study entitled The Compassionate Instinct, Dr. Dasher Keitner summarizes the emerging findings from this new science of human goodness, suggesting that compassion is, quote, an evolved part of human nature rooted in our brain and biology. Though many economists have long argued the contrary, namely that selfishness 
drives most of our human behavior. He goes on, he says, a growing body of evidence suggests that at our core, both animals from rats to chimpanzees and us human beings have, quote, a compassionate instinct. In other words, he goes on, compassion is a natural and automatic response that as luck would have it, has helped to ensure our survival as a species. It is adaptive behavior. Glory be. Neuroscientists at the National Institute of Health have similarly discovered that the human brain, in addition to being wired for selfishness, territoriality, and xenophobia and cruelty, which it is, that's the reptilian side of us, any student of human nature and human history fully understands that we are hardwired for darkness as well as for light, but that the human brain also, thank God, are naturally wired, hardwired, for generosity and altruism and compassion. In a recent Washington Post article entitled, New Findings Suggest That Good Impulses Are Basic to the Brain, Doctors uh, Moll and Grafman report that acts of human generosity and compassion, quote, activate a primitive, pleasure-driven part of the brain. Doing goodness is almost as good as sex, is what they're saying. A, a pleasure-driven part of the brain that usually lights up in response to food and sex. Altruism and compassionate concern for others, this study suggests, quote, was not a superior moral faculty that suppresses basic selfish urges, but rather is basic to the brain, hardwired and pleasurable. And then the article goes even further and reports that several similar neurological and behavioral studies, quote, are showing unexpectedly that many aspects of morality and altruism appear to be hardwired into the human brain, most likely the result of evolutionary processes that began in other species, back to the rats and the chimpanzees. That's where we get it from. Other research from the interconnected fields of neuroscience, evolutionary psychology, behavioral health, and developmental science have all verified this hopeful conclusion. As one scientist in this field writes, again and again, studies have suggested that compassion is indeed a natural and evolved part of human nature, vital to good health and vital even to the survival of our species. This emerging understanding, he goes on, is transforming our view of humanity in a somewhat more positive direction. And there is even more good news here. Not only does compassion come naturally to us as human beings, it also does us individually a personal world of good, contributing both to our physical and mental health as individual persons. Researchers have found that not only do compassionate and altruistic people enjoy more overall physical and mental health, they tend to be happier, experience less stress and depression, recover from illness more quickly, and probably live longer. That's, you know, the grumpy, selfish people are more miserable, if that makes you feel any better. Although the effect on longevity is still unclear. It's not sure if being good, a good person will actually keep you around longer. You know, the, only the good die young. That's kind of, the, kind of the opposite thing there. All right. The bottom line is that compassionate people find more meaning and purpose and satisfaction in their lives. As one scientist puts it, a life rich in compassion and altruism is a life of meaning and purpose because it is focused less on satisfying oneself and more on others, compassion boosts our well-being because it can broaden our perspective beyond ourselves. Research shows, the scientist goes on, that depression and anxiety are linked to states of self-focus. If you're a narcissist, you're gonna be miserable. 
a preoccupation with me, myself, and I, when you do something helpful for someone else, that state of self-focus shifts to a state of other focus, which can both lift your mood and energize you. And then he, he goes on, one additional way in which compassion may boost our well-being is by increasing our sense of connection with others. People who feel more connected to others have lower rates of anxiety and depression, higher self-esteem, uh, are more empathetic to others, more trusting and cooperative, social connectedness, these authors conclude, generates a positive feedback loop. Generosity, a positive feedback loop of social, emotional, and physical well-being. It's to your advantage to be kind. Okay, so the data is in. Social connectedness and compassion generates a positive feedback loop of social, emotional, and physical well-being. And recent research, I know this is a little heady scientific here, but also reveals that compassionate and generous people make, duh, better spouses, better parents, better neighbors and friends, and are therefore people who, want to, who, who other people want to be in relationship with. And the final bit of good news I have to share with you about compassion this morning is that it's contagious. This morning in the Time for All Ages, Linda told that famous story of fishes and loaves. I don't believe with the fundamentalist Christians that suddenly those little bit of bread and fish some, somehow miraculously multiplied. No, the miracle was in the compassion and the generosity. Social scientists James Fowler and Nicholas Krasakis have, dem have demonstrated by means of several social experiments that acts of compassion and generosity, quote, beget more generosity and compassion in what they call a chain reaction of goodness. It's contagious. Surely you've all heard recent news reports, or maybe you have experienced this positive phenomenon of people at the Starbucks drive through where you, you pass it forward and you pay for the person behind you, and that that, some, that chain sometimes goes on for a day or two, where everybody buys coffee for the next person. Sometimes the resulting chain reaction of goodness lasts for hours. Human compassion, blessedly, can be contagious. All right, so this morning we've learned the following things about compassion. Compassion is one the dual process of being aware of another's suffering and then crucially acting to help relieve that suffering. The second thing we learned is that it is a natural, hardwired and prim primal, primitive part of being human and it's evolutionarily adaptive. And that does us and everyone around us a world of good, both physically and mentally. And the third crucial part about compassion is it is a contagious commodity that ripples out from individual acts of goodness to uplift and improve the whole world. But now the final question for us to consider this morning is compassion is contagious, but can it be cultivated? Is it something we can cultivate? And we included an insert in your order of service this morning uh, just for its take-home exercise. I don't want you to look at it now because my words are much better than those. <laughs> take that home and take a look at it. It suggests some of the ways that you can cultivate, uh, cultivate uh, your capacity to be compassionate. The answer is apparently yes. Yes, the, uh, the uh, Cultivate Compassion people say that it can be cultivated they write, we often talk about some people as being more compassionate than others, but research suggests that compassion isn't something you're born with or not. Instead, it can be strengthened through targeted exercises and practice. And here in, in the handout I give you are specific science-based activities 
for cultivating more compassion in your life. And for all you parents out there, I want you to note the, the bullet item that says, one of the best ways to cultivate compassion in your kids is to show them that you're leading a compassionate life, that you go to the soup kitchen, that you pay it forward, that you help a woman who slipped in the grocery store. You are compassionate. Your children learn compassion. So it's time to wrap all this up. Here is the good news I will share with you two Sundays before Easter. You are hardwired for compassion. It is part of your birthright as a worldly creature. It is natural, it is contagious, it is evolutionarily useful, and you are free by God to cultivate more of it in your heart and in your life. You are free to cultivate it in your children and your family and in your friendship circles. When you are compassionate, not only do you bless the world, you more bless yourselves. Compassion is a sacred gateway to the holy city of your own life. It is a precious gate to the holy city of your own life, pure and simple. Amen. Our closing hymn. Our closing hymn today is number 1060 in our teal hymnal, As We Sing of Hope and Joy. So please rise in body and or spirit and join us in singing. send you on your way this Sunday with the closing words which the First Parish of Concord, Massachusetts say together every Sunday. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak, help the suffering, honor all beings.
Amen. We now extinguish this flame. But not the light of hope and truth, the warmth of community, not the fire of commitment. These we carry forth in our hearts until we are together again.
In this congregation, we are so fortunate to have a number of wonderful musicians who regularly come and share their time and talent and gifts of music with us. So um, thank you so much, Kate. We really appreciate it. And I have one other quick musical announcement. If you are an RE parent, I just wanted to remind you that 15 minutes after we're done here, um, there will be a children's choir rehearsal right here in the sanctuary. Um, we'll be learning a song for them to sing for Earth Day. So please bring your children. to everyone who participated in the service. And thank you again, Kate, for the beautiful music. We really appreciate it. Uh, we invite our congregants attending worship on Zoom to join us online for our virtual Greet Your Neighbor after the service to discuss the service. Um, the link is in the chat box and will be on the forthcoming slide. So we also hope you use the chat box as a receiving line to leave a message for everyone who participated in the service. Uh, those of you here in person are welcome to join us for coffee and tea. And I think there's also some cake outside. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day and enjoys the beautiful weather. Thank you.